From previous lectures, we know that the comma filter is the MMSE estimator for linear state space models with additive Gaussian noise. This means that for this model family, we cannot find an estimator that is better in mean squared error sense than the comma filter. In this lecture, we're going to relax our Gaussian assumptions a bit and see if we can still say something about the optimality of the comma filter for these models. Specifically, we will look at finding the best estimator in a minimum mean squared error sense, but where we restrict ourselves to an estimator that's a linear function of data. We will call these estimators the linear minimum mean squared error estimators, or the LMMSE estimators for short. So, to recap, we know that the comma filter computes the predicted mean in the prediction step and the posterior mean in the update step. And it does this if we have linear and Gaussian models. With this, we should note two things. First, the comma filter is a linear function of the data, y1 to k. For example, we can see this as we can write our estimate, x hat k given k, as this linear function of data. We can see that this is a linear function of data, and as these only depend on the estimate at the previous time instance, which we now know is also a function of only a linear function of data up to time k minus 1, this whole thing here is a linear function of data. Secondly, our estimator is the minimum mean squared error estimator. Among all estimators, it's the best estimator in a minimum mean squared error sense. And this comes from that we know that the posterior mean is the MMSE estimator. So if the comma filter is a linear function of data and it's the best estimator among all estimators, then surely the comma filter is the linear minimum mean squared error estimator. And now we're going to look at the properties of the LMMSE estimator in more detail. We start by viewing the static case where the LMMSE objective is to find a matrix A and a vector B such that the R estimate x hat can be written as this linear or affine function of the data y, so a times y plus this vector b. And we want to find a and b such that our estimate yields the smallest possible mean squared error. The key here is that we restrict our estimator to be a linear function or a fine function of the data. So why is this important? Well, in many situations, it's quite difficult to compute the posterior density, and even if we're able to do so, we still need to compute the posterior mean, which in itself is quite complex in many general settings. However, in many cases we can still find the LMMSE estimator, which has some nice properties. There are several ways to derive the LMMSE estimator. For example, we can find the optimum by setting the derivatives of the MSE with respect to B and A to zero, and then solve the linear equation system. Here it's convenient to solve for b first, which gives us b equal to the mean of x minus a times the mean of y. And if we put this into our expression for our estimator here, we get this expression. And if we collect the values where we multiply by a, we get And using this expression, we can now solve for a, which is equal to pxy, which is the cross covariance between x and y, and pyy, which is the covariance of y inverse. If we plug this into our expression here, we get the final expression for our linear LMMSE estimator. You might recognize this expression from the derivation of the Kalman filter, where this was essentially the Kalman gain, and this was the predicted mean, and this the predicted measurement. Although doing these derivations in the vector case could be a bit tricky, I would encourage you to at least go through the derivations for the scalar case, that is when x and y here are scalars, which means that a and b are also scalar values. 
Another popular alternative derivation is to use the so-called orthogonality principle. Let's for simplicity here assume that mean of x and y are zero, such that b is zero. An alternative approach then to find a is to require that the outer product of the error times y transpose uh, should be zero. We can easily show that this gives the same solution as before, as if we multiply in y transpose in here, we get the expected value of x times y transpose, which is pxy. And then we have the expected value of x hat times y transpose, where x hat is uh, just a times y because b is zero. So we get minus a times y, y transpose, expected value of that, which is pyy. And this should be equal to zero. And here we can easily see that if we solve this for a, this is equivalent to saying that a is equal to pxy times pyy inverse, which is the same expression that we get if we solve using the derivatives of the MSE. So as we see, this condition here only holds true for the optimal solution. So, but why do we call it the orthogonality principle? Well, let's look at this for the scalar case. If we have two random scalars, the expected value of the product of these can be viewed as the inner product in a Hilbert space. So the expected value of two scalars x and y is an inner product in a Hilbert space. So if the expected value of x and y is zero, we can interpret this as x and y are orthogonal to each other. So this is equivalent to x orthogonal to y in this Hilbert space. The advantage with viewing it like this, that the expected value here is an inner product, which means that x and y are perpendicular to each other in this Hilbert space. So the advantage with viewing it like this is that we can consider it in terms of vectors. So if we have our Hilbert space with our vectors x and y, let's say y like this, and we have another vector x like this. And we want to find an estimate of x, which is a linear function of y, which means that we are restricted to move along this line defined by the vector y. Clearly, the best we can do is to choose an estimate x hat equal to some scalar alpha times y. We want to choose alpha such that we minimize the error between x hat and x. So we want this here to be the value that is closest to x. So clearly this is the projection of x down to y. Where the error is orthogonal to y. So this is the closest we can get to x if we restrict ourselves to moving along this line y where the error is orthogonal. Any other choices of x hat would have a greater error. So we want x minus x hat to be orthogonal to y. So for our random variables, this means that we should find an estimate such that the expected value of the error times the observation is zero. So this is equivalent to finding the expected value of the error x minus x hat times uh, the observation to be zero, which is the same thing that we started with here, right? If you like this vector illustration and you're curious to figure out why the expression of A looks like this, I can mention that in the vector illustration, pxy is the inner product between x and y, and pyy is the inner product of y and y, which is simply the length of y. Using this, I'm sure that you can figure out why the expression looks like this.
I would also like to note that we have made no assumptions regarding the properties of X and Y in this case, in terms of their distribution or how they relate to each other. To derive the LMMSC estimator, the only thing we need to calculate is the mean of X and Y, as well as the cross covariance between X and Y, and the covariance of Y, which could be challenging in itself, but we will later on in the course show efficient way to approximate these in more general settings. When, for example, we have nonlinear motion and measurement models. Here is a self-assessment question about the conceptual differences between the LMMSC and the MMSC estimator. Before we looked at the LMMSC estimator in the static case, if we expand this to the dynamic case, where we sequentially want to find these matrices and these vectors, such that these estimates, the prediction and the posterior estimates, minimizes the MSC for the prediction and for the posterior, respectively. We should note that these linear mappings here are based on all the data up to relevant time index. So we have all the data up to time instance k minus 1 here, and all the data up to time k for the posterior. We should also say that this is not strictly a linear function, it's called an affine function of data. So we have a linear mapping here plus some constant b, and this is called a affine function. So if we consider a slightly relaxed version of our linear state space model, where we still require our motion and measurement models to be linear functions, so we have a linear function here of a previous state, and the measurement model is a linear function of the state at the current time. And that our noise processes, q, k minus 1, and r, k, should be entered additively here. However, we do not require that neither our prior nor our noise processes should be Gaussian. The only thing we require is that these should be independent random variables in time and with each other, and that we should know their mean and convariances. And so it's a bit of a more relaxed version of our linear and Gaussian model. A key result for this model family is that the comma filter produces the LMMSC estimator both in the prediction and in the update, which also has the correct error covariance. So pk given k minus 1 and pk given k that we calculate in the comma filter are also the correct error covariances for our estimator. So for the linear and Gaussian models, the comma filter computes the MMSC estimates, but if we relax the Gaussian assumption, the comma filter still is the best linear estimator. However, there are probably nonlinear estimators, so nonlinear functions of the data, uh, that can give us better estimates, but they will probably be more computationally demanding and put higher requirements on what we need to know about our noise processes, for example. We will not prove this result in this course, but if you're interested in trying it out yourself, one way of going about it is to use the orthogonality principle we discussed earlier in an induction proof. The outline of the proof will be something like this. First, we assume that the estimate error from the previous time instance is orthogonal to the data, and that the calculated covariance is actually the true error covariance of the estimates. What we then need to prove is that the prediction is still orthogonal to all the data, and that the predicted covariance is also the predicted error covariance. And this would then conclude the proof of the prediction. We can now use this result to prove the update step. So we want to prove that the posterior estimate is orthogonal to all the data up to time k minus 1 and to time k, using these expressions here. And then we need to prove that the posterior covariance is the posterior error covariance. If you would like to follow this proof sketch yourself, I would recommend that you do this for the scalar case where x0, qk-1 and rk are scalar and zero mean, in which case you can ignore the vector b as they will be zero. So best of luck. So here is a fact and a statement for you to consider. 